Um, so, because I teach statistics, I decided to use a lot of formulas on the slides, so I hope that's okay. No, that was a joke. <laughs> to test who's awake and who isn't. But the, the fear shows that you're exactly halfway the, the course now. <laughs> okay, so um, because you're exactly halfway, yesterday, um, if everything went according to plan, you worked on matrices and matrices and matrices and matrices. And the idea of these matrices, of course, is that they're just a tool to finally get to where we want to be, because the matrices are only an intermediate step on our way to an intervention. Of course, the matrices don't in themselves do anything with behavior change. The intervention is only step four, the matrices were step two, and today we're going to talk about what's in between, which is step three, which is basically what's under the hood in an intervention, so-called the, the active ingredients, or in intervention mapping terms, the methods of behavior change that together cause the behavior change um, in an intervention. Um, such an intervention doesn't influence health directly, as you've been learning these past days already. It works through people's minds, because people's behavior is controlled by whatever they think in their brain, and that's actually what you try to influence. And thoughts that people might have in their brain, as pertaining to an intervention that I'm kind of involved in regarding ecstasy use, might be thoughts like whether people actually like to use a strong dose of ecstasy, MDMA, that's a drug, and in the Netherlands the dose of MDMA in ecstasy pills has increased dramatically over the past decade or so which means that this is a big problem, so that's one of the things we're making interventions for. So one of the uh, things that determines whether people eventually use higher doses of ecstasy or not is whether they think they like the effects. But something else that might influence it is what they think their friends might do, or whether they think they can actually obtain pills with a lower dose or not. So these are beliefs, these are kind of like uh, forms of the change objectives that you've been working on in the matrices. And these change objectives are all part of categories of similar beliefs or change objectives, which we call determinants, such as attitudes, perceived norms, or self-efficacy. This is what you actually change when you change behavior. You can't directly change behavior unless you use coercion, which is ethically a bit circumspect when you just grab people and make them do stuff. So we try to not do this. So instead of having methods of behavior change that actually are methods of behavior change, we actually have methods of behavior change that are more like methods of changing a lot of stuff in between that eventually change behavior. So it actually looks a bit more like this. Our first converted into an application. I'll explain later on what the difference exactly is and why this conversion is so important. And those applications change specific ideas that people have. Those specific ideas can be explicit, like the examples I just showed. For example, people's ideas about norms that exist in their friends group. Uh, they might also be more implicit, like certain associations people have or certain attentional biases. They're very specific, tiny aspects of somebody's psychological functioning. Those are targeted by methods for behavior change. Those together aggregate into umbrella variables, which we call determinants. And those determinants influence a sub-behavior, a performance objective, and eventually behavior. So in step three, this, this uh, sequence is basically what we'll be working with, and step three has three tasks. It's very convenient. The first one is to generate, or one of the steps, because intervention mapping is iterative, so you can choose whichever order you prefer. One of them is to generate the themes, components, scope, and sequence. Those will come by again later, and then I'll define them. Another is to choose the methods that you actually use to change the behavior, and then you have to translate those into practical applications that you can actually use in an intervention. But first, I tend to start with a recap of step two, because sometimes after people have been working with step two a lot, it all gets a bit chaotic, so it's useful to get everybody on the same page again. So, a model of human behavior. The idea is that we want everybody to have the optimum quality of life. And a big determinant of quality of life is people's health not a determinant in the intervention mapping modifiable psychological determinant sense, but an antecedent, a variable that predicts it. Um, people's health is predicted by people's behavior, because people have healthy or unhealthy behavior, and this behavior also impacts their quality of life. So that means that behavior is a useful link if you want to improve people's health and or quality of life. People's health and behavior are also influenced by their uh, environments and their personal determinants. If you live near 
a toxic factory or near um, a nuclear factory somewhere in Belgium that has some cracks and might explode at any time, like here. Um, that environment can have very detrimental effects on somebody's health. Um, environment can also influence people's behavior, of course. There can be cues, there can be, for example, um, like here you have the staircase, and the staircase here in the building has nice little footsteps leading to it, and the door is invitingly open, and the inside of the staircase is painted in a terrible color, which apparently, based on research, is a very pleasant color. So this stimulates people to use the stairs. Um, and of course, there are the personal determinants, the, um, the variables we discussed earlier that are in people's heads that determine their behavior. So basically, those two types of causes of behavior are together, by definition, an exhaustive description of the universe. So everything inside a person we consider a personal determinant, and stuff outside a person is their environment. So the skin kind of separates those. Around this person, you have different, um, different environmental levels. So you have an, an individual, and around that individual are people's friends, colleagues, uh, co-workers. So we are now each other's interpersonal level. So if you would now all start screaming and running outside, odds are I would as well. Maybe in a different direction, because it might be because of the lecture, so I might not want to follow you. But. <laughs> You also have an organizational level if you work with a group of people that is actually part of an organization. So if you're working in a company or a hospital or a school, then it means it's an organization. And if you work with people in an organization struct organizational structure and you have actors available at the organizational level, that means you have different ways of influencing those people. For example, their boss can tell them what they have to do, which can be convenient. It's not always the best way to do stuff, but it can be convenient. Around this, you have a community level. So you have Bigger groups, for example, people who go to church or are involved in sports um, events, which brings or makes possible, enables different ways of influence as well. And then finally, you have society and even global communities. So each of these different uh, levels enables different behavior change methods. But the way you think about this is always the same. You always eventually try to think about who you want to change and how you can achieve this. That's because. Everything in the environment is eventually determined by the behavior of somebody else or by a group of people. So everything in everybody's environment is determined by one or more people who also have behavior. And one of those behaviors can be making the decision to change whatever the relevant circumstance is that you're thinking about. And those people, being people, also have environments and behaviors. And those environments, of course, are also determined by other people. So eventually, in this world, at least, almost everything is pretty much under our control, which is convenient because it means we only have to influence people, and it's also slightly less convenient because influencing people is not always easy. So the idea is, if you get how to figure out which environmental and personal determinants to change, you can change people's behavior. So that's as easy as it is. Um, when we talk about behavior, because we want to change the behavior to change people's quality of life or health, usually we actually use behavior as kind of an umbrella term again. We actually talk about something like condom use or exercise or healthy diet. And each of these actually consists of a lot of different behaviors. And condom use, for example, might start with somebody deciding to actually use condoms. Then they actually have to go out and buy condoms. They have to discuss those condom use with a partner and they have to use them properly. And each of these so-called performance objectives can have different environmental and personal determinants. The reason why I do or do not ask for condoms at the store might be very different for why I do or do not carry condoms, or why I do or do not use them properly if I'm in the right setting. So because those uh, performance objectives can have different personal determinants and different environmental determinants, it's useful to distinguish them. And this is also how you determine whether you distinguish them. If you have a bunch of potential different, potentially different performance objectives, but they actually pretty much have the same determinants, you might as well lump them together. And if you have a broad one, and it turns out that actually all the determinants and beliefs that you figured out seem to nicely delineate into two piles, you're probably talking about two performance objectives. So that's kind of a guide of where to slice your behavior into little bits. Okay, <clears throat> so the personal determinants are kind of the key because all environmental influence works through the decision of other people, 
who also have personal determinants. And those personal determinants are inside your head. In inside our head, we have our brains, and our brain has lots of regions, like the visual cortex and the motor cortex and the sensory cortex. And some of those, like the motor cortex, we pretty much know where it's located. So it's located here, and it's pink, and it determines <laughs> all your all your movements, your physical movements, and thereby all your behavior by definition, unless you define behavior also as something that completely happens in your mind. But usually those don't have influence on people's uh, health or uh, quality of life. So we can say basically, by definition, because all motor movement of everybody is determined by their motor cortex, by definition, we need to change something somewhere in the brain so that something in the motor cortex eventually changes at the moment of the However, unfortunately, those determinants that we use to study, like attitude, perceived norms, and self efficacy don't have one little spot in the brain. So that's a bit of a problem. But what we do know, this is kind of a useful framework to build up ideas about behavior change. What we do know is that our brain consists of like 86 billion neurons, brain cells, and those brain cells communicate to each other. And they communicate using something called an action potential, which means that they can activate and deactivate each other, roughly. So you have these patterns of spreading activation, and that is eventually something, those patterns eventually reach your motor cortex, and that's what fires your muscles. This pattern of spreading activation is a useful metaphor that also works at higher levels. And in order to illustrate this, I, will, I have a little um, game, also again to check whether you're awake. I'll now show a number of words. And all you have to do is remember them. You're not allowed to write them down, of course, but they're only visible for one second, so you probably won't manage. So just remember the words. When they're done, I will show... Oh, it's a good thing I remember. Because I'm recording, I have to manually press next each time. When the list of words is done, I'll show another list. And then you have to indicate of each word in the second list whether it was in the first list. Is that doable this early morning? You had coffee, so it should be... Are you all completely ready? Okay. Okay, so what's cloud in the list? No. Excellent. Hospital? Yes. Yes. No. Yes. 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 No. Yes. No. <laughs> Excellent. It always works. <laughs> okay, it doesn't actually always work. I'm just saying that now because it works this way. <laughs> So this is a, a research paradigm that's used a lot in um, psychology. It's used to create false memories, which is a bit of an overstatement for what you're doing. But what's actually happening in your mind, that's the theory at least, has to do, well, it doesn't even, yeah, okay, it has to do with these neurons by definition. But it's the same kind of explanation that you can use when you look at neurons. In your mind, <coughs> you have these different terms stored in your memory, more or less. And the list of words, the first list of words, contained a lot of words that were all kind of related. So all those words came by, and this theory argues that <coughs> when each time you activate such a word in your mind, it also activates related words. So there's a central word called the lure. lure. Okay, I don't know exactly how to pronounce it, so I should probably skip it next time. There's a central word, and this central word, because it's related to all the other words, receives a little bit of association every time one of the other words is listed. When I ask you whether one of the words in the second list was actually in the first list, you can't rewind time. Uh, therefore, you have to figure out some other way to figure out whether the word was in the list. And what your mind does, according to this theory, is probe the activation levels of that concept. And because this central term was so closely related to the other terms, it also reached a relatively high activation level, and therefore you infer that the word was probably in the list. And that's why some of you, I won't name any names, but some of you <laughs> thought that this word was in the second list. Well, this idea of related concepts that are in your mind, um, that explains part of our psychological functioning, also works for at higher levels than just words. So you might, in years from now, in 10 years, you might think about studying and then you might think about the amazing intervention mapping summer course. You might think about Maastricht and the Maas and the beautiful weather that we have here. 
Um, and then you might think about Luna Rossa, which is a great ice cream place um, near the Maas. And then you might think about ice cream, even though ice cream is in itself not really related to the first word. All the concepts in your chain of thought were related to ice cream. So you might have a sudden ice cream craving, for example. So this model of different concepts that are associated to each other and can activate or inhibit each other is a useful metaphor, useful metaphor when you think about psychology. Because it works, we know it works at the neuronal level, but apparently this metaphor is also useful at higher levels. So if you think about human behavior, it all starts with perception and outcomes behavior. And there's something in between which in psychology we um, respectfully call cognitive emotion. And you can consider this all as consisting of nodes, of different concepts, different units, different some things that are all associated to each other. And that can activate or inhibit each other. So when something enters your perception, when you see something, for example, you get these activation patterns of neurons. And eventually, you get the activation patterns reach your motor cortex, and behavior comes out on the other side. Now, these are like some 86, 87 billion neurons, so we won't map those. But those patterns still work at higher levels. Those the so what you could say is that your friend's thoughts about condom use are actually a set of similar concepts that are a part of these activation patterns. Attitude about condom use might be another set. And those friend's thoughts about condom use actually consist of what we in intervention mapping often call beliefs, subdeterminants, such as what does Piet, which is a Dutch name, think about me using condoms? And what does Eva, a Dutch um, girl, women, female, feminine, name, think about condom use. Or Bas, because those the th opinions of those three are apparently very important for me, so th their opinions might determine whether I use condoms or not. Those three together, their opinions, because they're the entire social <laughs> circle I have apparently, those three together form my friend's thoughts about condom use. In addition, I know two things about condoms. I know that they decrease the likelihood that I contract HIV, but they also decrease the sensations I perceive while in coitus. So those two are my attitude. So in psychology, basically what we do, we identify thoughts, beliefs, subdeterminants. We cluster them based on either functional similarity, so they roughly do the same thing, or similarity in form, so they're all about norms, for example. And those clusters we give a name, such as subjective norm, attitude, self-efficacy, or intention, which is a big variable which you could C as encompassing all of those. So the behavior explanation theories that are used to construct the matrices in step two basically use these psychological theories and use what we know about which kind of thoughts are similar enough or functionally similar enough to usefully cluster into determinants. And then the theory basically says, well, these are the definitions, these are the variables, so these are the kinds of thoughts that we cluster together, and this is how they're associated. And then you have the recent action approach, for example, or the theory of recent behavior, a theory of planned behavior, sorry. So to recap to the beginning, we have health and quality of life, and we want to optimize those. One useful route to do that is behavior. Another is through changing the uh, environmental factors. Environmental factors are just controlled by the behavior of an agent. And behaviors actually consist of sub-behaviors, which we call performance objectives. Those performance objectives are each predicted by different determinants and environmental factors, but the environmental factors didn't fit, so we'll have to deal with the determinants. And those determinants consist of beliefs. And those beliefs are thoughts or ideas or associations, parts of a process that are all related in some way psychologically. So the beliefs are eventually what we want to change, because those determinants are, by definition, formulated at a generic level. Those psychological theories, like the recent action approach, which argues that attitude, perceived norms, and self-efficacy predict behavior, works for recent action. So it works for a lot of behaviors. So it can never specify which ideas, which thoughts exactly predict people's behavior. Otherwise, it couldn't work for exercise behavior and diet behavior and sexual health behavior, etc. So the theory says this, these are the variables. This is how they're defined. These are the kinds of thoughts they contain, more or less. And then for every different behavior, every subpopulation, etc., you have to figure out, okay, so which are actually the beliefs that are important. So the beliefs are the things that you target with your intervention. So, for example, somebody might have to believe that bringing up condom use at the moment supreme 
might be very hard, or preferably slightly before they will master Prem, of course. Um, might be very hard. If you can change this successfully to the idea that bringing up condom use is actually very easy, then the idea is that they're more likely to use a condom. So that's the goal. And the theory says that if you change all the relevant thoughts and ideas or aspects of processes or implicit associations that are relevant for that determinant, then the determinant is more or less like an average of, the, um, of those subdeterminants or beliefs. So that means that you can change the behavior. Eventually. So, <coughs> when you're done with step two, you have your matrices, and that means you can look at how changeable and relevant they are. You can look at the literature for both of those, or if you're lucky enough to have done some quantitative research with your own population uh, and behavior, you can look at that to determine how changeable and relevant each of those seem. And on the basis of this, you can determine if you have limited resources, of course, we usually have unlimited resources, but very rarely you work in a situation with limited resources, so you have to make some decisions. So you can determine to not focus on injunctive subjective norm, for example, uh, because it's quite hard to change and it's not relevant at all. So that way you can already make some selections as to what you'll focus on. In your and then you'll make your um, matrix of change objectives, and those change objectives are basically those sub-determinants, those beliefs, that together, ideally, cover everything that's relevant within a certain determinant for a certain performance objective. So this should be an entire, a complete map of everything that needs to be changed inside somebody's head for all the factors inside that person that contribute to uh, performing the behavior to be optimal. So this is what you generated now. So now we can start thinking about how we change these things. So we have this uh, overview, and now we move it further to the right, so we can have more room on the left, to actually look at what we do to change the, the beliefs, and those are the methods for behavior change. And as will be clear later, those are, again, theoretical, psychological uh, methods that have been discovered, derived, established through a lot of research. And because they're theoretical, and they're not designed to change people, we don't have some buttons that we just had to discover, but they're actually designed for different purposes. It's very uh, important to apply them properly. And some of those instructions are in the parameters for effectiveness. I'll give some specific examples later. These same things work for environmental actors, because again, those are people. But for environmental actors, being at a higher level of an organ, like for example, they can be an organization, or they can be susceptible to political influence, so you have different methods available in addition to the ones you have available for normal people. So this is an illustration of um, where methods for behavior change actually originated. Um, and it's a little movie that I made in PowerPoint, which is a lot of work. So it's very, very short. So pay attention. So he's dead. And the nice thing about, okay, uh, the, the upside to this tragic <laughs> event is that now Fred Flintstone doesn't have to go into the bush to realize that that's maybe not a good idea. So early, way, way, way back when we were still animals, we learned ma mainly to, uh, through trial and error. So you have to experience something, and then hopefully if you survive, you learn that it's maybe not a good idea to do it again. At some point, we evolved into being able to learn vicariously, to being able to learn through observations of others, which of course speeds things up considerably. That also allows us to use a computer without first having to invent one from scratch, etc. So this is very, very useful. And of course, it's, it evolved simply because it has evolutionary benefits. I mean, if you are able to learn more quickly, you're less likely to die, you're more likely to have more progeny. So the whatever genes caused us to be able to learn uh, vicariously spread through the population quite quickly. So this is something that we can uh, leverage when you use behavior change. And the method that you use if you leverage this is called modeling. And it uses this vicarious learning, the ability of people to learn through observations of others. And if you want to use this, you have to expose those people that you want to learn to an, ad to an ad adequate model. And the model has to perform the right behavior because, of course, there has to be something to copy for the target audience. And there are some parameters. 
because this doesn't work when it, all the time. You have to be quite specific about how you use it. For example, the people that you try to uh, change or let's say help have to have the correct skills and competences. The example that Gerio always uses, and that I therefore now also always uses, even though I don't own a car, is that Gerio, with his Volvo, goes to the garage, and then he watches the mechanic fix his car. So it's a perfect modeling situation, because Gerio sees the guy doing it. There are benefits if he would learn this himself, but Gerio doesn't have the useful skills. At least that's what he says. So therefore, he can't actually model the behavior. So one of the preconditions, one of the parameters for modeling to work, is that whoever you expose to the model has to be able to perform the behavior. Another one is that people have to identify with the model. So that means if you use a model that's celebrity, people are usually less likely to identify with that model because they know that the world that the celebrity lives in is very different from their own. So there are very few reasons for that person to believe that copying the celebrity's behavior will yield the same benefits for them. This also makes sense from an evolutionary point of view. If you um, if early animals were to adopt any behavior they see anybody uh, doing, for example, they see a bird flying off a rock to get some food, and they're like, oh, I want food, let me try that too. Uh, those people kind of like evolve out of the gene pool. So that's why you only model behavior when you think it's the person who performs the behavior is similar enough to you that you think you will get the same benefits. Well, of course, the model has to be positively reinforced, so you have to the model has to be rewarded because you have to think that you will be rewarded. And it has to be a coping model. This again has to do with the realism. A coping model is a model that shows the same kind of struggle that you are experiencing with your behavior. So if you want to go to the gym more frequently and somebody is trying to help you by with a modeling intervention. And in the modeling intervention, there's somebody who says, yeah, I realized that I wasn't so healthy, so I wanted to go to the gym. So then I just went to the gym every day for a year and now I feel much better then you're very un unlikely to copy that behavior because you'll be like, yeah, <laughs> that's not how it works for me. Um, so those are the parameters which are very, very important because they basically formulate aspects of how one of th those methods actually work that you have to honor, respect, uh, take into account when translating those methods, those theoretical principles into your intervention, into the practical applications. And these are so important because these methods for behavior change that we use these methods to change aspects of people's psychology were never designed for us to use them to change aspects of people's psychology. They were just, they just evolved, they exist for some other reason, but humans were never created in some way to be influenceable. So that means you're using something that was actually created for a different purpose. And that means that it comes very, it, it's very, um, well, you have to do it the right way, otherwise it doesn't work. Sorry? It, yeah, yeah, sorry. Well, the fact that a model should be a coping model rather than a mastery model um, is one of the parameters, yes. So when you use a modeling, the model shouldn't just be effortless about the target behavior. Because usually when you're activated as a professional, when you're called in, um, that means that the behavior is something that's probably hard to change because otherwise people would have done it themselves. Um, so that means that the behavior will be something that in the experience of the target population is something they struggle with. So that means that if your model is like, oh, yeah, yeah, I just did it and it was fine, then it will kind of disqualify itself as a re reasonable model for the target audience. Yeah, yeah. It's too bad for the model. But. Um, so those methods for behavior change are organized per determinant. So you have methods for changing knowledge, self-efficacy, attitude, subjective norm. And this, again, is makes sense because research in psychology never we, we generally don't do research with one specific target population and one specific behavior we generally want to figure out how people work in general as psychologists and that's why our behavior uh, explanation theories are all formulated at a general level we have theories of health behavior or reasoned action because they deal with health behavior for everybody similarly change of those determinants is studied at a generic level. So that means we do research into ways to change people's attitude or change people's self-efficacy or to help people with planning. Again, these change methods are not studied at the little belief level. We don't have whole research lines studying how to explain to people that if they use condoms, the probability that they contract HIV is a little bit lower. Um, instead, we just try to 
help people change their knowledge or um, increase their knowledge or risk perception. Um, and this again makes sense if you look at what, how these determinants are defined. Because attitude, for example, attitudinal beliefs are all defined as some perception that a behavior will lead to a certain consequence combined with how desirable I think those consequences are. All subjective norm beliefs are all about my perception of somebody else's behavior or my perception of somebody else's approval of my behavior combined with how likely I am to um, conform to them. And finally, uh, self-efficacy beliefs are all about obstacles that I perceive or my own perceptions about my own competence. So these, because these determinants are defined as similar aspects of human psychology or functionally similar aspects of human psychology, it also makes sense to study changing them in terms of determinants. If you um, have those uh, methods for behavior change, for example, they can, uh, you have to use them for the right determinant. So a hammer works quite well for a screw, uh, for a nail, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it works quite well for a screw because this screw has a, a sharp point. This screw would already be a lot more, a lot harder, and a bolt, I think it is, um, well, would probably not work because it doesn't have points, so you can't use a hammer on it. So there's there's this match between which methods work to try to change which determinants, and you have to use them the right way. So if you actually have the right method and you match it to the right determinant, this is how you have to use it. So I don't know how much experience with do-it-yourself stuff you guys have. So this is not how you should use this, and this is also not how you should use it. So those parameters are also very important. So even if you have managed to identify the right determinants and you figure out which methods are able to change those determinants, you have to be very aware of the parameters to make sure you use them properly. And then finally, of course, the, um, the, the behaviors you want to change have to be, of the, sub, the performance objectives that you want to change have to predict the behavior. This <coughs> metaphor uh, drops a bit apart. I'll skip this bit. <laughs> so there are three conditions for effectiveness for behavior change. First, you have to have the relevant target. The belief has to uh, predict the determinant, and the determinant has to predict the behavior. If those don't work, your method can work perfectly, you can apply it perfectly, but you're changing something that doesn't target, doesn't influence the relevant behavior. You have to find the right method. The method has to be able to change those determinants and beliefs, and you have to apply it properly. So you have to uh, respect the parameters for effectiveness, because otherwise, even though you have a method that can work for changing the determinants that are relevant, because, for example, people can't identify with your model, it will still not be effective. So some examples of this. If you uh, have an intervention that changes knowledge, like this beautiful intervention, if this would be your model, these would be the determinants and their relevance for changing the behavior, and the screwdriver is a symbol for the method, um, you could have some effect. D, Cohen's D is a measure of effect size, the only statistical bit in the uh, presentation. Um, and basically 0.5 is an average effect. So you could have an average effect with this intervention changing knowledge. With the exact same intervention, if this were the situation, and the tiny arrow shown from knowledge to behavior shows that knowledge doesn't actually have a big influence, instead self-efficacy and subjective norm have a big influence, you could use the exact same method, the same screwdriver, but the effectiveness would be much lower because you're targeting a determinant that doesn't really predict people's behavior. Similarly, those parameters for effectiveness to illustrate those, the, as we just discussed, receivers have to have the necessary skills. They have to identify with the role model. It has to be a coping model instead of a mastery model, so they have to struggle. And uh, the model has to be positively reinforced, because if there's no kind of award in it for the model, then why would I copy the model's behavior? So, for example, if this would be your intervention, As you see here, this is a this model is really, really struggling. The saw is the modeling intervention, of course. And again, we have an effect size of 0.5. So we have an average effect size, so we're happy campers. If this, however, would have been the intervention. It's a mastery model. 
and even though we use the exact same intervention, and we actually even use it properly for the most part, still it will be much less effective. And final example, uh, fear appeals, which are uh, an enigmatically popular method for behavior change, um, based on the lay assumption of a lot of people that if people perceive a threat, they will change their behavior. And part of this lay assumption is that people's perception of threat is mainly determined by people's perception of the severity of the threat. So if people think that something terrible will happen, they will change their behavior because, of course, who would do something if it was bad for them? And people being completely rational, of course, immediately comply. Um, however, we've done, or we, lot of, lots of other people have done a lot of research, and I've done a little bit of research into this, um, and it turns out that it's actually, unfortunately, a bit more complicated. People's perception of threat is a function both of the severity and of how susceptible they themselves are to that threat. In addition, their behavior is not only determined by their threat, but also by their appraisal, their assessment of what they can actually do about this threat. So as soon as you perceive a threat to your, to your health, for example, if you are smoking or you're not exercising or you're, refusing, you're not using a condom or whatever, and you think about, oh, there's a threat, I might get HIV or I might get cancer or whatever, then you start thinking, what can I do to avert this threat? And if you can't really think of something, if you are not like, oh, I can just do this and then it's fine, then you have a problem because then you feel very unhappy about yourself and about your behavior. People often respond to this by actually changing their perception of the threat. So, for example, they will um, reminisce about their great aunt of 106 who smokes eight packs of cigarettes a day, etc. This efficacy component, again, has two uh, components because we love symmetrical models. One of those is response efficacy, which is how effective my behavior is in diminishing the threat. And the other is self-efficacy, which you might be familiar with by now, which is how competent I think I'll be to perform that behavior. So if both of those are high, you get behavior change if people feel threatened. If one of them is low, you won't. That's what the theory says. At least. So according to this theory, if you have a population that's very high in efficacy and you use a fear appeal intervention, that's actually quite a good one because you emphasize both severity and susceptibility. So you have two tools in your intervention. You will again achieve an effect size of exactly 0.5. It's a miracle. <laughs> However, if we have a population that's low in self-efficacy and we use an intervention, if we add a component that actually effectively manages to increase their efficacy, we might get the same effect size. But if we use exactly the same effect size and we don't change their efficacy, because they're low in efficacy, when we threaten them, they will have defensive reactions because they can't change their behavior. Because as far as they know, there's nothing they can do. So to maintain some mental health, they will change their perception of a threat by thinking of that same grandmother or father. Um, so if you have those methods for behavior change, those uh, methods for behavior change target determinants, and those are both at this generic abstract level. In an intervention, you have to be very specific. You have to craft a message, which you use in a campaign where you talk to people or somebody else talks to people, uh, or you have a school program or a movie or a website or an app or whatever. You have to have something specific where you target specific ideas that people have. So you have to target the beliefs and you have to translate the abstract method for behavior change into the practical application. And in doing this, you have to take into account those parameters, so the um, conditions that you have to satisfy to sufficiently mimic the, the behavior change process as it actually evolved or came into existence. Because again, people are not made to be influenced, so it, it's really, you have to be very careful when you do, that, do so. And you have to take into account factors relating to the population, culture, context, those things. Because those, of course, are all explicitly not a part of the methods for behavior change and the determinants that are studied in the general psychological literature. So modeling, for example, you can translate into uh, role playing with people. You can translate it to a movie um, that's shown on TV, or you can make billboards. So the same method can look very, very different depending on how you translate it to a practical application. So now we covered two of the three um, two of the three aspects, two of the three steps in step three. 
we identify methods. Well, actually, if you identify them, you use the tables in the intervention method book, of course, and then you look in the literature. But the tables are a really nice starting point. So that's actually the identification part is the easy part, also because they're organized based on determinants. Um, and then you translate them to the practical applications. The only thing that remains now is to discuss the themes. Um, for these, again, we go back to the matrices of change objectives. If you have these matrices, you organize all your change objectives by determinant. And then you, once you have organized them by determinant, you look at different methods that you could use. And you select one or different methods that you can use to change those change objectives based on the determinants that they're a part of. Then, for those methods, you translate them into one or more practical applications. And in doing so, you take into account the population, context, culture, etc. And of course, very important, the parameters for behavior change. Those applications together form your program. So that's actually what you'll be working with in step three. You can combine these applications into your program in different ways. So each application represents one or several um, methods for behavior change. Um, once you have your list of applications, you have to think about, but usually you do it at the same time, whether you combine them into one huge component. So you just have one program. For example, you have one course in a school, or you have one movie you show people, or you have one uh, role-playing session or whatever, or whether you separate them. So when you, have a, when you work in schools, for example, or when you work in organizational context, it can be useful to have several different programs spread over time. Of course, the disadvantage is that you might not have everybody all the time. So some people might only get a smaller dose of your intervention. You also have to think about the order of the components if you have several components. If you have one component, you have to think about the order of the applications within that component. You have to determine which topics are discussed in your components, because of course you'll be translating your methods to practical applications. So you'll be translating them into normal language. So in some way you are talking to people. So you have to determine where your boundaries lie what stuff you discuss, what you don't discuss. And finally, you have to make sure that even though you have all these different change objectives, different methods, different determinants, different applications, to the end user, the audience that you're presenting your intervention to, it seems like a coherent program. So those are the four um, final steps. You have the components. These components have to be in a certain sequence. You have to think about what you cover in the components and what you explicitly don't cover in the components. So you have to determine the scope of your program. And finally, you have one or more themes which tie everything together. So it's a coherent whole for your audience. And then you're kind of done with step three. Then you've generated those themes, components, scope, and sequence. You've chosen the theory and evidence-based methods, and you've selected or designed practical applications <coughs> to deliver the change methods. The order of these things, of course, can vary a bit uh, because intervention mapping is iterative. So you might actually start with generating the themes and the components. You might start with practical applications or the methods. This all depends on who you're working with and how it's going. The important thing is that you consider all of these things. And then you're done with step three and you're ready to move on to step four. But that's not that's for another presentation. Uh, oh yeah, very important throughout the whole process. Check your change objectives. Keep your matrices. I mean, you made them with blood, sweat, and tears, so you might as well use them a lot. Keep them handy and keep checking whether you still address all of your change objectives. Because you're, you're looking for methods, you're translating the methods to applications, you're integrating them into components, so you're working with the same material a lot. And kind of like those games, you know, when you have like a piece of rope and two cups and you talk to each other. And some stuff tends to get lost along the way. So it's very important to keep in mind your change uh, objectives because you didn't identify them for nothing. Those are the things you have to change. So if they don't all end up in your final program, well, you're doomed. Well, and with that happy message, <laughs> we'll uh, close this presentation. This is um, the end of this presentation, but if you have questions, I actually made the mistake of not putting my phone here, so I have no idea about the time. But there might be some time for questions, so if you have some, then there are 12 minutes for questions. Yes? Yes, I can. I'll stop the recording first.